All right, yeah. So yeah, good to be back here. So I will cover a lot of things. So feel free to ask me questions, you know, anytime you want. And uh, the talk is the curious case of SEP training. And uh, the reason I call it curious because it turns out that SEP training works very well, but at the time we don't actually understand why it works. We have some intuition, but you know, later on some people actually develop theory on that why it works. So, you know, that's why the title. And um, let's see. Oops. Okay. Next screen. Okay, there we go. Right. So you know that in machine learning, right, there's label data and we view that as no, it's very important. But then there's also a lot of unlabeled data, but they are very hard to use, sometimes messy, you know, just like rocks. So the question is, how do we turn, you know, unlabeled data into something like silver? And um so that would be my supervised learning. So this would be the main theme of the talk today that we will talk about. And uh, that's uh, about two years ago, uh, Vincent Van Hooker, he's a, he's a principal scientist at Google Brain. He wrote this article also about one of our work where he told that there's a quiet semi-supervised revolution at the time. So why, why did he call that? Because you know that in the past, right? People, try semi-supervised learning so many times. So at first, when there's little data here, the semi-supervised learning actually works better, but then it's still very poor. And people start to ask like, why don't we just collect a bit more data, a bit more label data, just to get the performance to be better. But then as you collect more data, there's a question come up, what if we just get rid of the semi-supervised learning part and then supervised learning, we just works better. So there's no point to do something complicated when you can just keep collect more data. So that's the, the past belief of many people about so much supervised learning. And uh, recently the, the curve actually shift, you know, the red curve now, there's some magic happening and it can actually go up above and so much supervised learning actually always better than supervised learning across, you know, this full spectrum of label data. And there's a, have been a few, you know, um, improvement in terms of how do you, how do we add noise to the uh, SEP label data, which I will talk about today. So the agenda would be that I'll talk about unsupervised data augmentation. So this is a complicated method, but it will hopefully give you a motivation of why we eventually end up with SEP training, which is much simpler. And we'll talk about uh, SEP training for vision and then SEP training for NLP and beyond. So uh, unsupervised data augmentation, this is a class of uh, method called consistency training. And uh, here's how it works. So uh, when we have label data, right? So we have the data, which is X, and we have the label, whether it's a cat, a dog, or something else. And we try to do the supervised cross entropy loss, which I hope everyone's familiar with. And then what do we do when we have unlabeled data? Let's say we have a different cat, so the, the idea is let's try to add some noise to the data, make it uh, maybe, you know, add some brightness to the, the, the image, rotate it a little bit. So just do some perturbation. So this will be the same object. And then we want to force the model to be consistent. So the same model M here, when it, if it take into input X here, or the perturb input, they should produce similar distribution. So that's the idea. And then we can just sum the two laws together. So that's the consistency training in semi-supervised learning. Is everybody with me? Okay, cool. Um, so here's the intuition of why it works. So let's say we have some data points here. We have like, you know, four data points for the, the green cluster and four data points for the purple cluster. And these are labeled data, and then the, the gray ones are unlabeled points. So as we start training, the, the loss will actually, it, we will actually propagate the label in, to nearby point. So we start to figure out, oh, you know, so these are actually the, the green luster too, even though there's some mistakes uh, here. But as we train longer and longer, um, we actually learn the separation between two classes. So, so that's how um, uh, consistency training works. So remember that, you know, on one side, we have the, the prediction from the label data. And on the other side, 
we try to propagate, you know, by by doing the by you know do the add the noise and then let the the label propagate across other examples in your training data. So the difference in UDA is that we actually don't use the symbol noise, but we use something more advanced, which are uh, augmentation operation. So what do I mean by that? Um, so we can do like, if you have a sentence here, we can first translate into French and then translate back into English. So you can see that they have similar meaning, like given the low budget and production limitation, this movie is very good. And then, you know, there's a back translation tension. It's like due to the small dollar amount and production limitations, the Ulster film is very beautiful. So it's kind of similar. So the, the label stay the same. And uh, for computer vision, we can do something like random augment. This is like, um, it's a series of random operation that you can do. You can rotate, you can do brightness, you can control uh, how much you want to rotate, how much brightness you want to add to the picture. So basically we, what, that, it's very simple. We just try to get a better noise. And that noise is achieved by having some augmentation method that have um, the domain knowledge. So here's the result. You, we can see that you know um, when we just use simple uh, augmentation like crop or flip or cut out, it's perform. So this is lower is better. It's perform worse than using random augment, which is a more advanced augmentation method. And similarly for NLP, if we use switch out, which is you know just randomly replace a word, or uh, the performance is uh, the error rate is higher. But if we do back translation, something more advanced, the the error is lower. So state the augmentation is important. So that's the message of a UDA. Um, and we actually test across uh, different tasks and across different number of label examples. And the curve here, the, the blue curve is the semi supervised learning curve achieved by UDA. And the gray curve is the one from supervised learning. And uh, if you remember my picture before, you see I really marked the, the, the mental picture of, of Vincent. That semi supervised learning curve is all the way above the uh, supervised learning curve. And that also applies for vision as well for the other data set, which is sci fi and SVHN. So in summary, data augmentation is an effective perturbation for semi-supervised learning. And it works, UDA works well for language and vision and can also combine with uh, transfer learning. So uh, maybe let me get uh, my train and um, do you mind giving me my, my bottle? Any question for this part? So there is a question. Okay. Uh, there was a question about uh, what, what do you find more effective uh, in terms of uh, uh, semi supervised learning? Is it more effective in the pre training step or more effective in the downstream uh, task adaptation? Oh, I see. Um, let's see. That's a good question. Um, let me try to understand again. So there's a question of uh, whether semi supervised learning is more helpful in the pre-training steps or in the fine-tuning stage, right? Yes, that's right. So uh, whether it's more effective in the pre-training step or in the downstream task adaptation. Right, yeah. So uh, I think it depends on the task. Um, so I think in, in computer vision, it looks like self-training is actually more uh, the the fine tuning stay actually uh, more important that self training works better. But for NLP, pre training works very well. So, you know, so pre training is a form of semi supervised learning. But uh, there's a paper that's showing that um, self training and pre training can be, or can be complementary. Or, or, in other words, semi supervised learning during pre training or fine tuning are somehow complementary as well. But in computer vision, people don't do a lot of pre-training um, until recently, like you know, some of the self-supervised learning. Okay. 
So um, let's get to the second part of the talk, which is self training for vision. So um, just now we talked about UDA. So the success at the time, there actually was a lot of paper on semi supervised learning, like FIST match, UDA, mismatch, you know, you can name all of these. But they only work when you have a small label data set like Cypher and SVHN. But when we actually go to large label data, ImageNet, because ImageNet has about like 1.3 million label example. So semi supervised learning become very hard to get gains. We actually almost give up on this uh, noisy student work that we, we did later. Um, but you know, after about two times almost giving up, it turns out it, it works really well. And um, the idea is actually pretty simple. There's four steps. So the first step is, you know, let's say we have a set of label data, like you know, the images and the labels. We first try a picture model on this label data. And the second step, we take that picture model and we try to do inference on the unlabeled data set, meaning that we will get you know, a prediction. And then we can take like, you know, the, the most confident one as a pseudo label. So this is your pseudo label data set. And then we can combine the label data set and pseudo label data set together. And with some twist that we add some noise to train a new model called a student model or noisy student model if we have the noise. And the noise we have for vision would be, uh, you know, uh, data augmentation, you know, rotate, uh, brightness, clip, etc. And also we can do drop out. So note that in computer vision, it's not always, people don't actually do drop out because they're already like best normalization. So this is something uh, not popular at the time. And we can also do like stochastic depth Meaning that when training, we can remove layers randomly. And then, but at uh, inference time or at testing time, we will have all the layers together. So the idea here is we want to make it more difficult for the student to learn so that it can actually learn beyond the teacher. So these are the intuition that we got you know, at the time. So it's actually quite interesting or curious about self-training that why, about why it works. And someone later, you know, have some paper on theoretical um, explanation of why it works. So the, the last step actually that you can actually go back to step two with the new student as a teacher and then continue, you know, relabel the data and train again. So this is noisy student. Uh, I don't know if people have questions or are people with me on this one? Okay. Yeah, so maybe some have thought that maybe you have seen some of this before. Maybe it looks familiar to some of you. So let me give you a few perspective here that maybe some people will think about distillation. So there's a difference here that distillation is about speed rather than quality. We have a big model T, which is a teacher. We do distillation and we want a small model. Whereas noisy student, we actually wanted to have a, a bigger student model. We, we want to go for quality. So we actually don't go for a smaller model. We, we train a student model, which is equal or larger than the teacher model. And um, that's one difference. And another difference is the consistency training and SEP training that we, uh, the consistency training we talked previously for UDA. So um, inconsistency training, we do things on the fly. So we try with label data and unlabel data together. So we try this model M here on the label data. And then this model is fixed. We do stop gradient up for this model. It is take the, the, the input and then we do augmentation with, oh, sorry, to the, on the other path, oops, where we have the, the other model uh, prediction and we do the comparison between the unnoise and the noise example here. So this is consistency training. We want to make sure that the prediction of similar, similar input are the same. So this is consistency training. So step training is actually simpler. We train the teacher T model first. We don't, back, we don't do any back propagation here anymore. So this is fixed. 
So we try this, we use this model to get the pseudo label or the predictions. And then we want to make sure that that pseudo label is consistent with the, the way that the student predicts on a, a noise example. Is that clear to everyone? So it's it's a single model. It's a single step. We don't do two stage. Oh, it's right. not like we do. It's not like we have to pre train M first. Mm -hmm. These are trying to get it from scratch. Mm -hmm. So you just run. You have the M model here. You run the M model through one version of the input, which is a clean example, mm -hmm. and then you run the M model on the another version of the input, which is the augmented example. So those two M models are they the same? They are the same model. Exactly the same, but when we get the loss here, right? We back propagate the gradient through this path, but we don't back propagate the gradient through the other path because if we back propagate together, then it would collapse the the training. So we have to freeze one side. Does that make sense? Yeah. And uh, this is from scratch. Yeah, go ahead. Do I alternate? Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. So I think sometimes you get one batch of the label data and sometimes you get one batch of the unlabeled data and you train them, you sum the loss here in the consistency training. And um, this one useful when the label data is small that you can start from from scratch. But when your label, your label data is also big already, you can actually afford to train a good teacher model first. This is self training. You train a, a good teacher model first, you freeze it, you use that to label, unlabel example. And then use the unlabeled example as a pseudo label to train a new student. Yeah. That's correct. Yes, it's surprising that it works very well, <laughs> which is why it's curious. And uh, I think one reason is, I think we also have the noise here that forced the model student to learn beyond the teacher. And then because we sort of want the model to, you know, bring similar input together, the prediction together. So that has some effect of like regularizing the model. So it can actually correct some of the incorrect prediction from the, the teacher. It can surpass the teacher. Yeah. You will see it in the result. <laughs> yeah. And also, we'll talk later that when we do the zero label, right, we do some trust holding. So, some example that the model is not so confident, we don't include in the zero label so that we at least have some certain, you know, high quality, on, or at least it's not so bad to train a student. Okay. Great questions. So, experiment. Um, so in vision, it's a, the efficient net is actually quite popular. It's a family of model where you can just adjust a few parameters. You have a, the smallest model here, B0. It can go up to B7. And it works better than many existing models before it, you know, in terms of the number of parameters versus the accuracy. So it across the bar here. So we can go from B0 to B7 and with more parameter and with better accuracy. And uh, we use the label data set, which is ImageNet, 1.3 million example. And the unlabeled data set is about 100 times bigger than the label data set. And uh, as I mentioned just now, we have we trust holding 0.3, meaning that we take a teacher model, we predict on its image. So there will be like 1,000 classes with the probability. We take the maximum one. And only those where the maximum probability is greater than 0.3 and we take that image as a, a pseudo example. Is that clear? So we have about 130 images when we do thresholding. And out of that, 
it's 81 million. I missed the M here, unique images. And uh, we do iterative training, meaning that we have B7, we train a new season model, which is L2, which is a even bigger than B7. And then we take that as a new teacher, we do another round and another round. And uh, what you will see here is that, um, first of all, if we just do this efficient L2 model on the label data itself, then the performance is better than B7. But we can also be better if we do noisy student, where we start to use the unlabeled data set, we get 88.4. So it's better than the previous step at the time by 2%. So rough here is rough as the um, rule of thumb, like in computer vision, if you get 1% improvement in the image net, that could be a good paper in CVPR. So we got 2% at the time. And uh, it's also used much less data than the previous step yeah. The previous step yet you 3.5 billion uh, weekly label data set from Instagram. And our model also tries small in terms of parameters. So, and we can see that, remember this is the efficient net uh, curve just now we have. And if you apply noise student across different model size, we also get better performances. And something really fun is that, you know, when we try on this model, we didn't think about some robustness benchmark where, you know, people look at image A uh, images that the state of the image model fell. So it's very hard, like, you know, it's about sea lion, but we don't get to see the sea lion very clear. So the noisy student model can still predict it correctly, whereas the base model predicts lighthouse. And, uh, you know, if we look at the performance, we actually get very big improvements on these robustness benchmark even though we don't really optimize for it, we just get those for free. Was there a question or something? Okay. And uh, for the other data set, uh, like image nest C, right? So this is the image of a parking meter, which the noisy student got correctly. And the base like got like a vacuum. I don't know if you can see the other image. It's actually the swing in the, you know, in the background. It's a light, uh, you know, if you look very, I think you can still see in the projector, that is a swing. That the noise student got it correctly versus the mosquito net that the baseline got. So in, in summary, so much supervised learning actually really works at all scale from the low data regime with UDA to the high data regime with step training on noisy student. And we, I think we were, was for the first time was able to advance the state of the and image net. And we get the robustness gain for free because we were training the student, you know, to work with a lot of noise, you know, lots of augmentation on the images, which is why I think it, it, it become very robust. Any questions for this part? Yeah, uh, so, uh, so uh, one yeah. The second question is uh, you have multiple uh, noise, uh, noise, uh, uh, multiple ways to add noise, uh, which is better, like, uh, like more yeah, like, yeah, like, all, all this, uh, this, uh, right, <clears throat> yeah. So, the first thing is, um, um, this is a placement test. You're asking about the importance of noise, right, in step training. So, we do have some ablation tests that you know. Without the noise, the model is not as good as with the noise. So, so that's uh, that, that's that's what we observe in the noisy student. But of course, later on we do observe that you know, even without noise, we can still have a very good step training uh, approach for NLP. I think there's some magic in that. I think maybe the you know the optimizer, the stochastic gradient descent, have some noise in itself as well. So it it would just works. <clears throat> Does that answer? Yeah, and also for different ways of adding noise, like here, is there a clear like a pattern on which way you get better? Which one is more important? Yes, so uh, augmentation is always uh, important in, in computer vision. Mm -hmm. The the way that you rotate the image, you you know, add brightness, you know, uh, shift the image, crop it. These are always, these are very important in computer vision. So with, oh wait, um, 
No, but I think in this this result here, if we don't have, oh, that's correct, right? When yeah, if we don't have stochastic depth and drop out. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I messed it up. So yeah, so it looks like in this example, stochastic depth and drop out is is actually quite important. <laughs> I'm guessing because we're using a large model, we're using an L2 model, it's pretty large. Uh, so we need to do a lot more regularization. But as a good practice that, you know, when we use a random augment for computer vision, it's always helpful. Yep. All right. So, um, so that's come. <clears throat> And if you have the visual data, I mean the touch data, how do you choose the unlabeled data? Yeah, that's good. Can you repeat the question? Because I just So the question is how do we select the unlabeled data, right? Yeah. To uh for for self training, right? Yeah. And, and do we worry about whether the unlabeled data is uh, in domain or out of domain? I think the yeah, if the unlabeled data is Yes, so uh, in that case, we did uh, address this a little bit by using the thresholding. So when we look at the threshold of the, the so we, we take a teacher model, right? We do inference and we look at the probabilities. So I, I guess the assumption here is that if the data is out of domain, then the confidence will become low. And uh, if it's in domain, then hopefully the, the confidence score is higher, uh, the, the prediction score is higher. So I think we, we sort of, uh, you know, approximate that using the thresholding. Yeah. I think for the on this question, so um, is it possible to detect those um, sort of ambiguous samples and then uh, sort of like selectively mute the uh, pseudo labeling for those samples and just use cross entropy like um, but let's say we, we have a budget of using thousand labeled samples mm -hmm. can we sort of like um, cleverly select those samples yes. that are from the ambiguous samples and rely on the ground truth labels and it, instead rely rely as well and rely on the uh, uh, supervision of the frame model for more safe samples like uh, easier to classify samples is it possible so, um, so yeah, is your question, is there a way that we can have a, ha, can we somehow select example to label? So um, my question is about like, uh, based on this hypothesis, so like for those ambiguous samples that uh, you exemplified, uh, we, we sort of expect the trained teacher to produce like misclassified labels, right? Mm -hmm. Like th those labels will have a higher chance of being uh, noisy. Then right, maybe relative to other easier samples, like the, the more salient samples. So uh, what I'm saying is, uh, perhaps when we are uh, selecting those samples to be used with the uh, labels uh, for supervision, like actual labels, maybe we can select them from those samples that are more ambiguous, so that we can rely on the uh, human annotators. Oh yeah, ground truths. for sure. And, uh, and leave the uh, pseudo labeling. Uh, to the humans or the more safe salient samples so at least i think maybe let, let me try to say some fact and then whether it actually address your question is tesla calling something for auto label to where they sort of also take a, a trend model some of some sort of like do inference and see which model is not the model is not confident and then which means that it's a difficult example and then get human to label those example and then train the model is that is that related to your question? Well, I think it's, the question is about how to use humans in the group effectively, right? So when you have uh, uh, easy uh, augmented data, um, you want to trust the automatic labeler to use it. So you have difficult examples, you want to pass on automatic labeling, and you want to use the human to describe it. Just because in, in the defined problem, we have two types of uh, supervision, right? One mm -hmm. coming from a uh, prior uh, trained model's annotations, and one coming from uh, ground truth annotations, which is probably done by some human annotators. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, what I was suggesting is to uh, 
like uh, relative uh, human analysis and analysis those samples that are more uh, ambiguous mm. and only use ground truth label supervision to train the model for those samples. Not, uh, if, because if we use mm. uh, pseudo uh, annotations yeah. for those samples, it's highly likely that those annotations will be noisy because the earlier pre-trained model, model cannot distinguish them well. And then but what right. the earlier pre-trained model can distinguish well is more salient samples, like those samples that are more apparently belonging to a certain category. So maybe we can sort of like uh, use use a more principled approach in like selecting these yeah. uh, sets. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I think that's also an, an interesting area to look at as well. And uh, I think we can take that offline. But when you say like, if, how do you decide ambiguous example? Are you using the, the trend model and the, look at the prediction itself? Okay. I think we can maybe take that offline. We can chat more later as well. Cool. Yeah. All right, so for the last part, um, let's look at step training in NLP and, and other areas. So I'll start with other areas first. So uh, noisy still actually used in Alpha Flow 2 as well. If you look at the Alpha Flow 2 paper, it's actually a masterpiece. And one of the pieces, <laughs> uh, luckily, uh, also a uh, good thing for us that they're using noisy student to, they have a good model, and then they use that to set label other protein structures. And uh, the, the other part that uh, I also use that to improve Google search, even though I can't disclose much, the idea is, is kind of simple that if we want to have a student model, instead of doing the standard way of going directly from the teacher to a small student model, one another way you can do is you can actually go up to a bigger model T prime and then distill down to a smaller one. That will be better than going directly from T to S. So that's uh, for uh, some uh, Google search that I did. And uh, some people also did uh, set training for sequence generation. And they also found that uh, when we have the noise on hidden state, it's actually as a regularizer. And it can improve uh, other tasks like machine translation and text summarization. So uh, the big picture here is that we go from UDA on a small label data set, we go to noisy student on a large label data set with success and also other people applied in, on NLP data set, uh, the SEP training, which is the core, um, it worked pretty well. So the next part is, you know, uh, what would work for a few short NLP data? You know, we go back to a, a low data regime. And the answer is uh, what we did for EM NLP, uh, we call Strata, which is SEP training with task augmentation. Um, and, um, so here's a, here's a state of thing. So I guess everyone here is familiar that, you know, in NLP, we have a pre-trained model, right? We pre-train a model for the BERT, and then we do fine tuning on some label data for a target task. So that works pretty well. But when the data is, uh, when we look at the, the few short regime, where there's only a handful of example per class, you know, for example, A example per class, uh, the performance actually not a, a very high, and also, you know, it's actually high variance here, you know, it's actually not quite stable as well. And how do we address this? So uh, we use SEP training. So recall that this is how SEP training work. We have the label data, we try to teach the model, we do inference, you get the pseudo label data, and then we combine together to train a student model. And there's a question here, I think like uh, also related to some of the question people ask, like, you know, what pseudo label is there? Well, we should use, right? Um, so one approach people can do is maybe you will take the top K most confident example, like let's say top K 32. So in this diagram, um, uh, this uh, we so in this, the, the lab part here is like every iteration we add 32 most confident example and we keep those in the pool. And with the next round, we, we get another top 32 example. So the more, so we can get some improved performance for the few iteration, but then it will go down. And the reason is, um, but actually overconfident. So, you know, um, it's, it's overconfident. It's, uh, it's overconfident over to like those top example here. And then later on, this is the top is actually not very accurate in terms of uh, the label accuracy. And instead, uh, what we did was we used a, 
all the pseudo label example, we don't just take the top K. So, um, and the, the performance actually pretty stable. It's actually going up uh, across different iteration. <clears throat> so, so what we call is a, a prop distribution of example. We don't just filter by high confidence. We also have a low confidence as well, example. And there's a second question of like, uh, what model do we use for the teacher and the student? So here um, we have something called task augmentation, which I'm not going to in detail about it, but it's just a way that, you know, when we have a retrain language model, we can get an even better new model by just adding some extra synthetic data and where does uh, the data actually is uh, from the natural language inference. So this is an auxiliary task that we sort of train the model on. So we, what we do is we take some unlabeled text, but uh, it, it's in the same domain of the, of, the, of the final task. And then we generate some synthetic data. So maybe let me just give an example to make it easier. So let's say we have a sentence Tommy flu inhibits spread of virus, right? So we can use a generator, this data generator model here. We get a few more NLI example, the natural language inference. For example, we can have like the label being in Telvin. The, the data generation model will give you the sentence, the virus is less spread when Tommy flu is used. So this sentence implied this output. And for the neutral K, the time is not a good way to treat HIV. This is not related, right? And the last one is time flu promote virus spread. This is a contradiction. So these are the synthetic, um, synthetic, I'm sorry, uh, example that we sort of do an extra fine tuning, uh, extra pre training on top of it. So it will see a bit more example. It will see these sentences that sort of in the domain of the target task. Is that clear to everyone? So just, just to get the model to practice, you know, to practice on more example in the domain, even though we don't have the, the real label for the target task, but we can sort of generate the label, the example for the NLI task. So we can sort of do the, the pre-training on the NLI data set. So put the D together. So we can, we can also work without the task augmentation here. So these are independent module. But we combine them so that when we start with the pre-trained model, we get we can do uh, you know auxiliary training on the NLI task to get a better pre-trained model, which we use to start the, the student model and teacher model. Because we don't have that many examples in the task, this is few short learning. So the model would be quite poor to start with. And uh, this is an example like uh, we see before, right? This is a birth-based model. And this is when it's used our strata method. It actually can get very good performance, even just with a example per class. And uh, similarly for this uh, cyan uh, prediction. Um, so these two tasks have two classes that we predict. And uh, we can also get pretty good performance with just a example per class. And with uh, about 512 example per class, meaning a thousand example, compared to a total of 27,000 example, we, we actually on par. So we actually really uh, sample efficient, the, this method. And I think uh, some of you might wonder like what is the, how helpful is the task augmentation, TA and SEP training? These, are, these can work independently. Um, you know, independently they can have improvements, improve the performance of the base model. But if we start with, uh, if we do task augmentation first, we get a better base model 85 here. Then we can do SEP training on top, we will get further improvements. Um, so which is strata, this is uh, the final result. And it's also applied for, uh, for bird large as well. So we do task augmentation first to get a better base model 87. And then we do SEP training, we get even uh, better again. And we also compare with uh, an, uh, another work. It's uh, sort of like complementary to us where they sort of do like retrieval to find extra example that related. Um, so they're using a, a, a stronger baseline, which is Roberta Large. And um, they use the retrieval system. 
they get some improvement, but not as good as, as our results. Okay, and something actually quite fun is that you can also do strata on a randomly initialized model. So we just, we don't use any pre-training. If we don't do that, you know, we actually get some good improvement. And of course, it's not as good as if we have had access to birth base of birth labs. So I think it sort of changed the paradigm. I think it's even cool if we somehow can get rid of pre-training, but I think uh, at, at least uh, it's not just the case in, in, in this world. So in summary, um, you know, SEP training is surprisingly effective and work well across the domain, region, NLP, and beyond the Alpha Flow 2. And these are the different models that I talk about in this talk. Yeah, thank you. We have time for questions. Uh, there are a couple of questions on the uh, Padlet. So let me just uh, zoom to that. Um, so there's some questions here about uh, uh, follow up with pre training versus fine tuning. So there was an, uh, a question earlier about that. There are several different studies doing consistency and a downstream learning jointly or or in series consequently, right? Either, uh, either in a joint loss or, or um, then first training or, or pre-training and then uh, doing it to, uh, for a downstream task. Um, in your experience, what, what do you find is more effective? So um, in a joint loss, like I'm guessing whether the joint loss here is the, between Um, maybe I can clarify the questions. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, maybe the, the question isn't very clear. So if, if uh, you could clarify that uh, in a comment, uh, that would be great. Um, maybe we can take the, the last question though. Um, can we train the student with both unlabeled and labeled data in this noisy student model? Yes, so I think that that's what we did for noisy student, because uh, when we do pseudo label of the unlabeled data, it it, seem, it it looks just like pseudo label. It just looks just like label example. We just concatenate the two data set together. Uh, so uh, with some with some ways um, for the two losses, and the way can be achieved, you know, by how frequent you sample a batch. You know what is from the label or from the zero label example. So on the floor, do you guys have any other questions that you want to ask? You know, I have a question. So yeah. I, I mean, uh, NLP relies right now quite a lot on pre-trained word embedding, <laughs> uh, but you you noticed that Vision is not doing that much pre-training, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you think there are a lot of uh, specific things in NLP that are, are require uh, specific types of tuning, meaning mention test adaptation? Uh, but are, are there other uh, other methods that you, you find um, that might be a good approach? I mean, for example, there's a lot of work now on task adapters, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Just looking at specific layers in the model to adapt rather than adapting the entire model. Mm -hmm. So I guess there are two parts of your question. Yes. So the first one is, uh, is there any difference between vision and NLP that people do more pre-training than computer vision? I think, um, so in NLP, I think one of the challenges is that there wasn't a good augmentation method in NLP. So in computer vision, we can easily do things like rotate in you know, a crop and then we, we can recognize the image, right? In NLP, it's very difficult. I think the most you can have maybe the, you know, add some noise to the word embedding, or maybe you do switch out, you switch randomly switch a word. But um, a lot of the time, like when we start to add noise to a sentence, we, maybe we should change the meaning completely. So I think that's the, the, the big difference. And the only way, the only thing that I saw effective is the back translation, where we go back from English to French, go back to English, that preserve the meaning in some way. So that actually changes how people approach um, 
things in, in computer vision and NLP. So BERT, the mass language model, is actually surprisingly effective. Um, <clears throat> people can just do that. <clears throat> um, in NLP, in vision, some there's some work that, um, you know, you can just get rid of, they, they try to do some retraining, but actually not that effective. Yeah. And there's a second part to your question. Um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, there are different ways of doing adaptation, right? So yeah. we're talking about task of uh, adaptation or task augmentation, right. but uh, there are cases where people are, are doing adapters, right? So they're, they're just trying to tune specific layers rather than the entire uh, model. Yes. So uh, how do you uh, think about that? Is, is there any synergies uh, using those types of models where you're doing some form of regularization as well mm -hmm. uh, when you're doing the adaptation? So, um, so um, I don't have a good answer to that yet. Maybe we can you know, chat offline. All right. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience, either online uh, in Padlet? Uh, again, uh, the URL is right up there. Uh, so Shen uh, has a, a question here. Let's just try to take a look at that. Uh, sorry. Okay. Oops, did I turn it off? Oh, no, it's here. Um, a common thing is uh, the common understanding of meaning of words, but uh, in vision, if the understanding of this image may not be well adapted to another uh, vision task. Yeah, so this is, uh, I think somebody in the audience commented about the question mm -hmm. that I asked earlier. Mm -hmm. Okay, other question? Okay, if not, uh, let's thank, uh, thank Tang again for the talk. I'm still a bit jet lag, so you know some of the questions. I might not grab the full meeting, but hopefully we can chat offline. Okay. Sure. So uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, Tang, your slides are, uh, can we circulate them later? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you'll hear from us uh, on the slides of the recording later. Okay. okay. Thanks yeah. everyone for coming to today's <clears throat> session. Uh, thank you. Thank you.